Hey, everybody, you're going to be real happy you landed on this podcast today because we got a great show for you today. Stephen Wino is joining us from the Associated Press in a few minutes to talk about the Washington Capitals and their playoff chances and then just Ovi's goal scoring and lots, lots more. Thanks for joining us. But before we get to that, Coyotes, Arizona Coyotes update. It seems like daily now, Tim, that something new comes out contradictory stories from one side versus the other side, the other side being us, the press, the media, everybody trying to figure out what's going on with the Arizona Coyotes. And then the other side is the Coyotes themselves. So it's, it's two starkly different realities we're living in. Apparently we're, we're, we're in the Marvel multiverse. Nobody knows what's happening in one universe. They're buying the land. They're building an arena. Everything's great in the world. That's the Arizona Coyotes universe. And then in the alternate universe, is seemingly everybody else, you, me, Frank Cervalli, everybody else, where Coyotes are leaving, they don't have an arena, they're selling the team, and they're moving to Salt Lake City. So we don't know what's going on, and I think that's the biggest frustration. But what happened on Wednesday? More news broke, Tim, on Wednesday. Yeah, basically, Frank sent out a tweet, and then a bunch of tweets and other reporters followed it right after on Wednesday afternoon that the deal was all but official. Um, that they were going to sell the team, move to Salt Lake City, and the, the details are like still to be con- to confirmed. And Frank even tweeted out later that day, he's like, "I'm getting some pushback on this. Still, like, you know, a lot of lot of details to figure out, but this is going to happen. That's my understanding. Um, and the way that it's look looking like it's going to go is that the technically instead of selling directly to um, the new owners, that was it Alex Smith, Ryan Smith uh, in Salt Lake City, they're going to technically sell back to the league." And then the league will sell it to Salt Lake City so that everyone gets a piece of the pie. Again, this is like the big biz- big business stuff that I just don't really understand why they would do it that way. But that's the, the story so far. And it is strange because it sounds like they're going to sell the team to the league for $1 billion and then sell it to Ryan Smith for one3 So make a tidy $300 million profit for literally being the middleman. So again, I don't know why they do that. But apparently they're doing it. It's, it's a very strange thing. And then to find that. 1.3 billion for this team? Woof. That that's a bad deal considering the Senators just sold for what? 850 900 million last year. That's a lot of Coyotes are by far the worst team in the NHL when it comes to generating money. They're awful. They have a 5000 scene arena. Obviously that doesn't play into effect here, but all you're getting is just a franchise. Nothing that comes along well, with it. You get a team, I- you get players. I think as far as franchises go, a, a se- a separate from their location and all that stuff, they have to be one of the better buys just because of like the potential. If you're getting in and say, okay, this is, there's a lot of room for growth. There's so many good players. They're all young at the same time. We can really build something here if you're getting a deal, right? If you're getting a bargain, like this is a buy low opportunity for an owner. But the fact that they're going for more than even reportedly was being asked by the owner, um, which who was reaching in the first place is just a little bit strange to me. I guess you do get an already established NHL team and you get players, you get stars, you get players locked up long term, which is good. And then you get Liam O'Brien. And who <laughs> doesn't love that guy? He's he's all over their marketing. Every everywhere I look, it's Liam O'Brien just looking like an idiot. So let's just dig into the, a little bit about this and talk about why players are unhappy. They're frustrated because at the end of the day, as a hockey player, you want to feel like you're in the know. You want to feel like you're on the inside and and you're getting information before the media does, before everybody else does, because you are an employee for the Arizona Coyotes. So if I'm Clayton Keller, if I'm one of these young, good hockey players on this team, I feel like I'm being dragged around a little bit and just, you know, being blinded from actually what's happening because they they know less than we do, it seems like. And they're frustrated. They they don't know what's happening next year. And it's just it, it honestly, it's it's aggravating for them. Because what do they do next year? What happens to the team? And I went through this with Buffalo a little bit, not relocation, but more in the sense of we had, I think, three presidents in two years. We had multiple GMs, multiple coaches, and it seems like we were always the last to know. And it was a situation where every week we were having someone come in and go, okay, well, this is this is what's happening. This is this. And it was already after the fact that the news was already released. So it's just frustrating. And I don't know what else is going on, Tim, because an agent this morning said the 
the players, what did Gordy Miller say? Well, the first tweet, and, and you know, everyone's kind of breaking news in real time on Wednesday and Thursday, really since this news broke. But one of the major stories is that the players aren't happy, like you said. Sarah Sivian, who's a reporter that has connections with multiple players, said she's hearing some frustrations and fear from NHL families across multiple teams about the abruptness of relocation reports, the prospect of moving families to Salt Lake City, and generally the way this has all gone down. Folks are not happy. I think the, the last one is the most important one. The way that it's gone down, like you said, they're the last to know. They're not in the loop. They don't like the way that things are being handled. It's not communicated well. It's back and forth. It's rumors. It's reports. It's all this stuff. It does take your toll on it. It is distracting. And then Gordy Miller said, um, and he was responding to Sarah Sivian's original tweet, said from an agent this morning, the reason this wouldn't just bother the Coyotes players, that there are those who would have some form of limited trade protection who don't list Arizona on a no trade list, but might have included Salt Lake City. That's a really interesting point that I hadn't thought of. Is like if Salt Lake City was an option, you'd have to think for at least one player on the Coyotes roster would have had that on his no trade list, if not multiple, if not all of them or most of them. You know what I mean? Like, and now they have no ch- say over where they're going. Um, even guys that have full no trade clauses or partial no trade clauses now are being moved to another city, another state, another location without any say in the situation. It's a totally fair point. And then for players who maybe might be traded, they maybe they don't want to go to Salt Lake City, but you want to go to Arizona. It's a little bit nicer of a city, but it's it's just a mess. It's frustrating. And the, the frustrating part is we, we touched on it right when we first started talking the multiverse. Is this Arizona Coyotes Twitter page? It's like, what are we doing here? It seems like every time someone in the media, Frank Sarvalli or Darren Dreger or somebody else puts out a tweet saying, you know what, it's it's official. They released two schedules. It's official. The the auction isn't going to happen until June. You know, pushing back this. It's official. You know, they missed their target deadline of the trade deadline, which was the first, you know, we got to get something in, in place by the trade deadline. That passed. They always put out some kind of tweet saying, we're committed to keeping the Arizona Coyotes here. They put out some fancy schematic of, you know, the, the downtown complex they're going to build with the arena, the entertainment center. They always seem to have something that they put out, whether it's just grandstanding or just outright lies. That's the frustrating part for me. And I know it's for you too, Tim, because you you feel like they're dangling this carrot and they do it every single time. And we've lived through this. We work for people or with people who say, oh, we've got big plans, big, big plans. It's going to be fantastic. And then nothing comes to fruition. You ping them. You say, hey, what, what about those plans? And I'm sure everybody listening has had this happen, whether it's with you know loved ones or people you work for or work with or people you go to school with. It's like, hey, remember remember you talked about that that big thing that was going to happen? Or remember, remember we had that agreement where if we do something, I get this and it doesn't happen? This is happening with the Arizona Coyotes and us, the fans, the media, the players. They're like, oh, it's going to be great. Mullet Arena, two years max. That's it. And then we're going to have this big mass. We're going to be in downtown Phoenix. Oh, that's not going to work? Okay, well, we're going to know Mesa. Mesa is going to be great. It's going to be so, you guys are going to love it. It's going to be awesome. People are going to, it's going to be revolutionary. Oh, that's not going to happen? Okay. All right, we're, we're going to be by the airport. Oh, that's not going to happen? Oh, now though, there's a land auction in June. It's going to be just outside of Scottsdale. It's going to be epic. It's going to be fantastic. You guys, it's going to blow your doors up. Oh, that's, they, they don't want it there. The mayor said they don't want it there. Okay. Uh, but no, we're going to put this tweet out. We're committed. We're committed. We're going to find somewhere. We're going to find somewhere in the desert. It's going to be fantastic. You guys are going to love it. Oh, there's no sewage. There's no water. There's no utilities. There's no anything. Oh, but no, no, no. We love you guys. We'll keep, stick with us. We love you guys. It just it was a constant theme, Tim. And I think it's worn thin. Players are like to shut up. Tell us the truth. Let us know what's happening. If, if not, don't say anything. Because all these tweets and the pandering and the lying, outright blatant lying, it's maddening. And then the one they put out yesterday was just a piece de resistance. So Frank reports this and that, Sarah Valley. Oh, they're, you know, it's going to be wrapped up by the 18th. They have a schedule in place. They have this news. They have this news. And the Coyotes put out committed to keeping Arizona hockey in the desert and building an arena in Phoenix. And they put this stupid montage of the players. It's like, are you really? Are you? Well, show some facts behind this because it's just. It's worn out, and I'm worn out, and you're worn out, and I'm sure everybody's worn out about hearing about it because, you know, fool me once, shame on you, 
fool me twice, three times, four times, five times. Shame on me. And that's what it feels like. You, we're just dummies for believing them. And whoever runs their social media account should be ashamed of themselves. It's just too much. I wouldn't have been surprised if that came directly from the owner. Like, I don't know if he's got it on his phone or if he's making a phone call, <laughs> but he's like, it's a response to these reports started by Frank and then everyone else soon after. This is like within an hour or two of the news breaking, they sent out that video and there was nothing behind it. You know what I mean? Like committed to keeping Coyotes hockey in the desert and building an arena in Phoenix. Not to get all like English grammar, but you know who's missing from that sub that sentence? The subject. There's no person or organization. It just says committed. Who's committed? You know what I mean? Like it's a very passive sentence structure that means nothing. It has no weight behind it. And so it's just, it's just, it is pandering. It's it's kind of pathetic. I don't I assume it came from someone high up. It's not just a social media person scheduled tweet of the day, you know what I mean? So uh, yeah, it's frustrating. And so um, Frank said the latest report I read in dailyfaceoff.com this morning, the final home game is on April 17th against Edmonton, which I think is pretty, po there's something poetic about that. You know, the best player in the world is going to be in town, your final game. McKinnon's flying in for that game to watch? <laughs> yeah, he'll be there. Um, the final game of the season is at home, potentially the last game ever in the state of Arizona, um, but hopefully at least in that arena. And so... I think that'll be nice, but expect the news to officially drop and pick up some momentum around April 18th. And of the 5,000 seats, 3,700 will be Oilers fans. Yeah. So that, yeah. that, probably the Nation Network guys will all be there. Oilers that Nation. In itself is the real reason. They, and then <clears throat> it got me thinking. I don't want to stay too long on this. We got Stephen Wino coming on later, but this could have been successful. This team, they they could have really worked in Arizona because they do have the expats who come down there, you know, the snowbirds from Canada. You have like a fan base already ingrained in the city there. There are a lot of hockey fans in Arizona. When I was there, I, like you, you saw it. They went about it the wrong way. They didn't grow the game from a ground roots level. And I think at the end of the day, they didn't put a successful team on the ice. That's what it takes to have a successful team. You look at all these franchises, whether it's Florida, whether it's Tampa Bay, Dallas, San Jose, Anaheim, all the teams that went south, they had success. Maybe not early, but within the first 10 years, they had some success. Dallas, obviously, Stanley Cup, same with Florida. When they went to the Stanley Cup, Florida, that was a big deal for them. I think that was their third year in inception. Tampa Bay, early success. All of these teams, they have a common theme of just putting a good product on the ice. Arizona didn't do that. Maybe maybe a few years of somewhat success, but nothing sustained. They had Shane Doan. You have Jeremy Roenick. You have some good players scattered here and there. Nothing prolonged. Nothing really exciting. Who, who's the biggest star that they ever had? Shane Roenick Doan? or Kachuk. You know. Kachuk? Are those sexy players? Yeah, I mean, no, yeah, they're not. They're maybe not. Potato. Uh, yeah, okay. You know, Fine. they're they're hardworking grinders. Put up some points, but they're <clears throat> they're not vying for heart trophies. And I know someone's going to send some kind of message. Oh, what about this guy? No, they didn't ever have anybody who's <clears throat> vying for an MVP, a scoring race title, someone who you want to go to the rink and watch. I have that in Chicago now. Chicago's a bad team. People go because of Connor Bedard. Fun to watch. He's exciting to watch. He may have, you know, 20 minutes on the ice. 19 of them were just pedestrian. You get that one minute. It's like, woof, okay. Yeah, that was, that was worth it. That was pretty special. Arizona's never had that. They had it for half a year when I was there, and then <laughs> they traded me. So that was a their yeah. big mistake. You know, I, I was putting butts in the seats. But they've never had that. And I, I feel like they really blew that opportunity. Arizona is a great market. It's a great environment. It, the success was there to be had, but they just didn't, they didn't make it happen. And now they leave. So shame on you, Gary Bettman. And then the, the, the stuff. How many owners have they had throughout the years? I know, I know the league bought them back at one point and the league sold them. It's like shame on you for not having a... a just a solid base of ownership. That's so key. And it seems like they have that with Ryan Smith. That'll be great in Salt Lake City. You have to have a committed owner, not just like a hodgepodge of, you know, you know well, maybe this and that. And like, I can buy a team maybe. And then you have to sell and you don't in invest in the team. You can't buy players. You, 
the surrounding, you know, accoutrements, you know, within the team is just garbage. You, you players know that and they don't want to go and play there. So shame on you, Gary. Shame on you. But the owners are going to make a boatload out of this. So they're happy. They get they get the front end, back end of it, the sale and the sell. They're like real estate agents. Oh, we're selling the team for $1 billion, We'll take a piece of that. Oh, and then we're selling the team for $1.3 billion, We'll take a piece of that. Gary Bettman's the smartest little weasel I've ever known. All right. Anything else, Tim, on this subject before we get into quick hits? No, let's move on to the, f- the fun stuff. All right. Quick hits. For a limited time, our listeners get 25% off and zero Zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more, which in today's inflation, Tim, it's like a coffee. So it's easy to get that $15 or more, and then you get 25% off, zero delivery, but only if you download the DoorDash app and enter our promo code NATION25. That's it. We're the only one, as far as I know, who does this deal. 25% off, zero delivery, promo code NATION25. Not so fast, USA. Not for you. This is only valid in Canada. Subject to change, terms apply, whatever that means. Promo code NATION25, only available in Canada. Or USA, just can't catch a break. All right, speaking of catching a break, the New York Islanders, they're catching some breaks. They can't stop winning. They've won their fifth straight, just vaulted themselves into third place in the Metro, almost to a point now, Tim, where we can lock them in. They're three points up on Pittsburgh They've all played 79 games. There's three games to go. I think Washington might have a game in hand. I'm not sure. I'm looking at the standings in front of me, but they are playing fantastic hog. No, they all have 79 games, but they're there. They're playing great. And then last night, a huge, huge, massive playoff implication game went down. Pittsburgh Penguins, they played the Detroit Red Wings. And lo and behold, old Sid the Kid pulls out his old tricks again. He came through in the clutch. Pittsburgh wins in overtime. They take over the second wild card spot like I knew they would. Like, Tim, you were so just behind the times. You don't know hockey. I I know hockey. You said Detroit. I said the Islanders in Pittsburgh. You said Detroit and the Islanders, I want to say. And And Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Yes. Yeah. Detroit's out. Pittsburgh's in is where I thought they would be the second wild card spot a huge win. Absolutely huge win. Pittsburgh, the last two games, I know they lost in overtime the game prior to the, um, was it Tampa Bay Lightning or Toronto Maple Leafs? To the Toronto yeah. Maple Leafs. They pick up two points versus Detroit Red Wings. They are now one point clear of the Capitals, the Wings, and the Flyers, who picked up a big win last night versus the New York Rangers. But they have that separation. They have the lead and regulation win. So all they have to do is tie. They get that one tiebreaker versus all these teams looking pretty good. The odds people who do the percentages, Tim, analytics, which you know I love, odds are the Islanders make the playoffs 91%. Pittsburgh, 57%. That's better than zero. And so good for them. I think the Islanders have locked in their spot. The Pittsburgh Penguins still have a little bit of work to do. Washington Capitals, they have a a tough road ahead. They play Tampa Bay, they play Boston, they play Philly to close out the season. So they are not looking too hot. But like I said, Things change fast. These teams will go on a winning streak, a losing streak, lose three, win three. We're a long way from figuring out who the final two teams will be in the East or East Coast. But yesterday did clear up a little bit of things. Good for the Penguins. My goodness. Crosby, what did he do? What what milestone did he hit last night, Tim? Yeah, he assisted Carlson's overtime winner, which gave him his 1,000th career assist. Only the 14th player ever to do that. And Carlson, by the way, absolute rocket of a shot, full wind up between the hash marks, like great goal because he uh, made a blunder on the, the, I think the Red Wings tying goal by pinching at the wrong time and then looked over for it. And he was just, it was kind of sad, but, uh, but credit words to for getting that, that last goal. Yep. Good for him. He, you know what? I might have to just issue some apologies at the end of the year and he might be one of the guys I'm sending a card to. He's played good. He's, he's played, um, like, he's bad defensively. I think we can all understand that. But I, I feel like he's not taking as many chances as he did, as he did the last few years in San Jose because the games mean mean something a little bit. And yeah. you can tell he's trying more on the defensive end. And he's not just completely selling out the D zone for offense like he did last year in San Jose when he hit 100 points. But he's playing good. Good for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Good for everybody involved. I want to see Crosby in the playoffs. First round, take out the New, uh, the New York Rangers. That would be a lot of fun. All right, moving on. We had a big contract sign. Noah Hannafin coming to the Vegas Golden Knights from the Calgary Flames. 
Good trade for the Vegas Golden Knights. He's just signed a massive, massive extension. Eight years, $7.35 million extension. Now, here's a guy, Tim. Not going to really get a ton of points. I think his career high is 40, 45, maybe 50 in that range. But other than that one year, it's been around 30, 32. He's going to average you 35, we'll say. 7.35 for eight years. What do you think of this deal? I know Vegas, they had to keep him. They gave up a first rounder to get him. So they wanted to re-sign him. But he's, you know, he's 27. He's no spring chicken. He's 6'3", 220. So he's a big dude. Is that is that too long for you? This is going to carry him to 35 years old. What did you think of the deal? I love the deal for them. I mean, oh, Andrew is getting older. He's getting a little bit slower. He's still valuable. He's still, you know, a top four defenseman, but he's not the same guy that you relied on a couple of years ago. So Hannafin starts to kind of fill that spot a little bit as well as well as uh, Shea Theodore. So I like the deal. Obviously, it's going to be maybe a little bit overpaid when he's 34, 35. But then again, $7 million might not be as much eight years from now as it is now. So with the cap going up and everything. So I think it's a good deal. Good extension. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I like it. The, yeah, like you said, they're going to be losing a lot of players. Alec Martinez gone. Peter Angelo will be gone. This guy will be good. But ugh, that eighth year makes me nervous. I would like to see a six-year deal maybe. It's, yeah. Big defensemen do not age fairly well very often. But anyways, what else are we talking about? A, a, a retirement. Yeah, Jacob, Jacob, Jacob Silverberg. Silverberg, yeah, announced he's retiring from the NHL at the end of this season. Obviously, originally drafted by Ottawa, been with Anaheim for 11 years. Any uh, any run-ins with him? Any conversations? Or quiet no, guy? he's who, like, I don't know. I probably played against him for sure, but like who? He's, yeah. Is he a Swede or a Finn? Uh, I think Swede. I think Swede. Swedes don't um, talk. Quiet. Another report from Darren Dreger. Torts will be behind the bench next season. He's not going to be fired. He's not going to be moved up into the front office. He's going to be coaching again this year or next year. So smart. My, I, and I don't mean that sarcastically. I think that's a good move. He is a good coach. He is going to realize his mistakes down the stretch this year, and he'll be he'll be good for this team. But if you're like Sean Couturier, you're like shit, man. Really? Again? Okay. <laughs> Let's go. He's got like six years left under Torts, but. Who else are you going to get that's going to be good for this team? He's a good coach. Right. All right. What else, Tim? Last thing here, if you watched some college hockey last night, you know that both Denver and BC each won their Frozen Four games. The Denver BU one was, was excellent. Went to overtime. Such a fun game. BC won, I think, 4 nothing over Michigan. They're dominant. It's hard to see them losing in this, in this championship game, which will be played tomorrow, Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. Very exciting stuff. College hockey. Check it out. BC... Lots of NHL players on that team. I don't know much about Denver. I really don't. But yeah, check it out. It'll be fun. Well, I, I had a somewhat of a little rooting thing for Michigan. They had some Chicago Blackhawks players on them. Frankie Nazar being one of them. But it's fun. Check it out. BC, Denver, when is it? They play Saturday? Yep, tomorrow. I will not be watching probably, but I, I'll check the replay. All right. I think that's enough, Tim. Should we get to our interview with uh, Stephen Wino? Let's do it. I hope his last name's Wino because we have been calling it Wino. We'll see how it is. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Cheers. All right, everybody. As advertised, Stephen Wino. Is it Wino, Stephen? It's Wino. You got it. Nailed it. I wasn't sure. I butcher names constantly. It's what, I, what I'm known for, so I'm, I'm happy to call it the right. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate of it. Of course. Sorry that the Capitals are not up to par with what my performance will be today. You will definitely out, <laughs> be better than they are lately, and I, I, I don't blame you for their faults. I feel like they've been playing better than they should have been all season long, so maybe this is the expected team that now we're seeing in the, in the final month of the season. But anyways, like you said, we are in the final week of the season. The Capitals are in the playoff race, so to speak. There's three games left, so the hope is still there. But I guess if you go back a month, Stephen, from where they were to where they are, there has to be – some disappointment in that locker room. I don't know how close you are to the team. I don't know how close you are to the players and whatnot. You obviously cover them pretty closely, so I'm sure you have some inside information. But is there frustration there? Because one month ago, like I said, they were they were in in the race there. Yeah, John, there's disappointment there because a month and a half ago, they were so far out of it that it looked like they had no chance, right? So th this is a team that 
fought so hard just to get back into the race. They uh-huh. had to lean on Charlie Lindgren playing a lot. They had to lean on John Carlson playing almost 30 minutes a night every single game. And Alex Ovechkin had to get hot. And so many things had to go right for this team just to get back into the race. But I think that there's, there's also a certain sort of understanding, at least from Spencer Carberry and the coaching staff and the front office, that they kind of ran out of gas. That, that it, it just takes so much energy to climb up the standings and, and pass so many teams and be in the race even after trading Anthony Mantha and Joel Edmondson at, at the trade deadline, and guys who they probably could have used if they wanted to make the playoffs. Mm-hmm. But this is a team that's trying to do a little bit of both. They were trying to, to sell and, and build up assets for what will be a rebuild and also stay in contention too, which is a difficult place for Brian McClellan to be. And, and given all that, the fact that they're in the race is kind of a miracle a- after the deadline. But yeah, there, there's a disappointment because it was right there for them, or it still might be right there for them. You mentioned Charlie Lindgren, and I and I feel like he has been the main catalyst of this resurgence of this team. Can you talk about how good he has been? Because it's not abnormal for him to get 35, 40 shots a night and to stand on his head. No, he's been he's been their best player all year, John. I, he, he's been their team MVP. This is the guy who th- he's never played this much hockey in his life. A little bit at the A in the A, but not at this level, not with this much pressure on him. He's at some point in in I think December, I think. Uh, surpassed Darcy Kemper as the as the number one goaltender for this team and, and began shouldering the load for everything that that this team needed. And when there there were games where he was stealing them saves, stealing them wins and points and all of those things, it just it took its toll. Eh? There, there's only so much he he, he could do. And mm-hmm. if they were not scoring at least two goals a game, it was becoming very difficult. Who else on that team has been kind of an unsung hero? Because when you look at their roster and look at the stats, like there's no, I mean, obviously Ovi scoring the goals, Dylan Strom's putting up some assists, but there's no one that really jumps out above the rest. There's nothing on the on paper in the stats that say they should be even in the playoff hunt. So who are some of the other unsung heroes that have gotten them here? Him, it's the young players, and and it was Hendrix Lapierre, Connor McMichael, Ivan Shashenko, guys who were not really expected to play big roles on this team. But when you have Evgeny Kuznetsov get injured at, at a certain point, go into the player assistance program, then get traded to Carolina. You needed someone to fill that void. When TJ Oshie went down with the, the chronic back problems that he's been dealing with, you needed someone. Hendricks Lapierre wound up being that person. And then Ivan Mirshashenko, their first round pick from a couple of years ago, uh, jumped into that void. And and really, I think this, the biggest unsung hero of all is Spencer Carberry. And if this team gets into the playoffs, he should be the Jack Adams winner as coach of the year because of what he's done with a, an aging roster that expected to have Nicholas Backstrom and, and, and getting his nets off and all these guys and are not there. And he has just pushed all the right buttons along the way that said, okay, we're going to we're going to play fast and all these things. Then he realized we're old and slow. Okay. So mm-hmm. he adjusted it. Hey, we got to defend much better. And then when the goals weren't coming, he's like, okay, fine. We need to start putting more pucks on net bodies to the front. And everything started to work. I just think at a certain point, it was, there's nothing that anybody could do to kind of get them over the hump past teams like the Islanders, with, as well as they've been playing under Patrick Waugh. So you mentioned that this team is trying to navigate a rebuild, but also staying relevant and contending mostly for Alex Ovechkin, let's be honest. Where does this team pan out? Because when you look at their cap structure and their situation, there's not a lot of turnover that will happen from this year to next year. Yeah, you lose Pacioretty. You have to re-sign a lot of the young guys you talked about. The defense is pretty much solidified for the next couple of years with long-term contracts to Carlson and Jensen, Van Riemsdyk, and Favre and Sandine's new deal kicks in. So how does this team improve? How do they get better when you're keeping arguably the same team together for this year and next year and the next few years? Well, I think it's going to be the money that they save from Nicholas Backstrom being on LTIR for another year and possibly mm-hmm. TJ Yoshi being on LTIR for another year. And so you're the, the, Brian McLeod is going to take that money and be able to spend it, whether it's in free agency or trading for players who, who are on RFA or UFA deals. Uh, not, if the Vancouver Canucks do not re-sign Elias Lindholm, it would not surprise me if Elias Lindholm is in Washington long term at some point. A player like that, someone who is a, a top six center, is someone that, that Brian McLeod has been targeting for a long time especially with getting because that's at least half his money off the books for next year. They're going to be able to go shopping. And, and and this is not something that the Capitals are going to want to go after 30 to 35 year old players. But there is a window of, of age 22 to about 26, 27, 28, where the Capitals say we want to improve with those players where they can be part of trying to win 
now and help Alex Ovechkin break Wayne Gretzky's record, but also be part of this core moving forward, along with Tom Wilson, along with John Carlson, and Rasmus Sandin, Martin Faravari, Connor McMichael or Hendricks LaPierre, one of those two, to where there are players of a certain age level that they can improve pretty quickly. I don't know if they can get back to cup contending status, but they can stay as a playoff contender if Charlie Lindgren continues like this and they're able to improve and fill some holes up front. Yeah, that's that's the crux for me. If if they can't win a Stanley Cup, what what are we doing? Because yeah, it's nice to be competitive. It's nice to make the playoffs, be the second or third seed in the Metro Wild Card team. But if you're not one of those top teams, what what are we doing this for? Are are we honestly just trying to get Ovechkin the record? Is that kind of the incentive for the next two years? I think it's done, and and that's something that the Ted Leonsis and, and Brian McClellan and Dick Patrick have promised Alex Ovechkin that. They're going to have a team that can contend and be good enough to help him get this record. It's something that you obviously couldn't be talking about this if they didn't win the Stanley Cup in 2018, right? This is something that is an individual record in a team sport, but it's something that, that I think this organization really does care about. But it's also about, at least for the next couple of years while Alex Ovechkin's under contract, putting a, a quality product out there, a team that can contend for a playoff spot because it's already won, this organization's already won a championship with this core uh, of now, six years ago, which feels like forever yeah. ago now. But this is a team that's already won a championship, right? So being in contention for a playoff spot, being able to play meaningful games down the stretch, also long-term will help these young players. I mean, these are these are Connor McMichael and Hendrix LaPierre and, and even Vincent Iorio who came in for Rasmus Sandin playing games that matter down the stretch in the NHL that we're going to look at three, four, five years from now when they're back in contention saying, okay, this is where this the, sort of this build start. Yeah, that's where I... I'm just like, this stuff really, I, I scratch my head at because, okay, we won the cup. That was great. So now we're going to have to just mortgage our future, so to speak, just so you get this record. Uh, it's it's very rare for an owner to do that, to say, you know what, we're going to get good players just so you can have a guy to dish you the puck and to score a goal. To me, that screams of just, it, it's it's stupidity. In my eyes, because, yeah, an individual record is great. When Gretzky was scoring goals and getting individual records, he's he's stacking up cups. Like, that's why that guy's got, you know, rings everywhere. And Ovi, this team has no business competing for the next five years. And, and it's great to, you know, sign guys and put players on the roster. But as a young guy as well, I'm like, so I'm here and I'm going to mortgage my first three, four, five years just so this guy gets the record. And then we're going to be set back again. I, I as a big picture thinker, it doesn't make sense to me just to try to go for a record. But the good news, John, is what Brian McCullum did at the deadline last year was he was able to sell off all the UFA players for picks that he's not going to mortgage the future. Mm -hmm. And that's why he traded Anthony Matha. That's why he traded Joel Edmondson. So to where this is not going to crush the future of this team. They have Ryan Leonard coming from BC who might be a complete monster. And I think he's trying to, 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 to toe the line between we want to stay good and, and do this record. And it's really hard to do it. We saw it with the San Jose Sharks and, and Doug Wilson for a number of years of trying to reset and refresh and try to stay good enough. And then eventually they're, they are going to have to go into a full rebuild. We know that. We know that's going, that that's coming. But the way that that's happening, the way that, that Lars, El, that, that Lars Eller trade happened, the way that other, some of these trades have happened, the Capitals have been able to bring back assets. Even Dylan Strome, they got him for free when the Chicago Blackhawks didn't tender him a, an RFA offer. So that's, Sonny Milano, same thing, got him for free. I think that those are the kind of bargain deals that he can say to the organization, to the young players, to the fan base, hey, we're trying to win now, but we're also not mortgaging the future where we're going to bottom out in, in a couple of years and have to be terrible. Yeah, I, th I think if it was easy to do, everyone would do it. And that's why you right. see <clears throat> the Islanders in the situation they are. You got the Penguins, you got the Capitals, you got all these teams who are trying to navigate it. It's hard to do, and I feel like the Hawks are a prime example. They tried it for one, two years. It didn't work. So then they just sold everybody. Now they're mired in a huge rebuild. But you get Connor McDavid. You have the chance to get a high draft pick, lottery pick this year, and then that really expedites that rebuild. So, And then finding guys on the waiver wire, it's it's hit or miss. You look at the um, Avalanche this year. They, they swung and missed on a lot of guys. So anyways, I want to talk about Ovi because I've been a huge fan of his. But also one of the only guys saying, I don't think he's going to get the record. Very outspoken. I, I don't think he will. And then this year happens. And it feels like Ovi's stealing goals. He's being very selfish. 
everybody's looking for him at all times of the game. The guy would have a breakaway and he'd wait for Ovi to catch up so they could feed him, force feed him a pass. Is there a, is a very real cognizant thing happening in the Capitals dressing room where we need to get this guy the puck at all times? The owner, for Pete's sake, wants this record really bad. So does the players know, does Strom know, do all these young guys know, get over the puck at all costs? No, I, I don't think so because I, I this well, there was a certain point of the season where he had eight goals in his first forty three games. It wasn't it wasn't falling for him no matter what happened. He was getting a few bad bounces, but also defenses were were kind of focusing on him because nobody else was scoring on this team. And then all of a sudden he caught fire. Like things changed. He was able to take some time off in Dubai, got to see his family, and, and then and change sticks. A few big changes that started having the goals fall, but it was to a point where. They, they knew that Dylan Strong was going to be scoring more goals than Alex Sebeshkin at some point this season. And then Ovi just caught fire. And at, yeah. at that point, when you see vintage Alex Sebeshkin, he's 38 years old. No one scores goals at the at this level, at this age. Phil Esposito being the only one ever close to doing it. So when you see him open, they're going to pass him the puck because he has the best shot of anyone in, in the NHL. Maybe until Austin Matthews and Connor Bedard and, and these kids come into the league. I don't think there's a force feeding going on. I think there's a realization that on the power play, especially for the, the Capitals to score, they need to pass in the puck or at least make him a decoy and, and, and have somebody else, John Carlson from the top, TJ Ocean in, in, in the bumper, somebody else be able to do something. But th- I think the Capitals know that two score goals, they need to lean on him. I, I'm amazed, John, actually, that this guy got to 30 goals this season. After eight in his first 43 to get to 30 goals is absolutely insane. If you would have asked me at the All-Star break, is he is he breaking the record? I would have bet the mortgage on him not breaking the record. Now, he's got a real realistic chance of doing it, maybe even late next season, but probably the season after that. I have a couple, two more questions for you. Um, the first one is is Tom Wilson. He's probably in that, that top echelon of guys that you hate unless he's on your team, along with the Marshans and Kachucks of the world. But he's been pretty quiet this season. I haven't seen his name in the headlines, even with the resurgence of the heavyweight fighting brought on by Rampy and McDermott and Delorier and all these guys. What's Tom Wilson been doing this year? Well, he was an all, he was their all star and, and and had a really good first half of the year, and, and then kind of quieted down for a long period of time, and then got the suspension for for the swinging the stick uh, in, in the face of, of Noah Gregor, which didn't really make any sense at the time, and and he said it was unintentional, but. Obviously, with his history, the NHL was going to to, to hand out a, a hefty suspension, and did, uh, and didn't even appeal that. But it's been it's been a quieter sort of second half of the season for Tom Wilson, and I think they I think he's realized that when the Matt Rempies and Nicholas Delorier are out there, that the Capitals need him too much to drop the gloves and fight and be in the penalty box for five minutes. That he can do it when needed, and and, and has done it at a couple points this year, but. He's too valuable a player on a team that has lost so much depth, uh, especially on the right side, that they need Tom Wilson to to produce. And he hasn't produced to the level that, that maybe they need for him to get in, for them to get into a playoff spot. But that's what the Capitals need from him for now through the next seven years of this contract. So seven yeah. years. <laughs> Holy moly. That's a long time, Stephen, for, for a player of that ilk. Do you like that deal? Is that is that going to age well for Washington? I like that deal only for the Capitals, and I'll tell you why. Because this is a team that, that they know that after Alex Sebastian is going away, and we talked about this with the rebuild coming, that Town Wilson is no doubt the future captain of this team. He is a, a, a popular teammate. He's a guy who's going to be a leader for now and, and going to be able to shepherd the next generation of players, Ryan Leonard and whoever the next draft picks are, through this organization. He is the link to that Stanley Cup team to where every time you're going to have a jersey ceremony or whatever, he's going to be Tom Wilson right here. Everyone's going to be buying Tom Wilson jerseys for the next decade, probably. And, and he, and even, even if he's a fourth line player like Dale Hunter was when he was captain of, of this team back in the late 90s, there's a value to having him there. And because the salary cap's going to keep going up and up and up, having him on the books is going to be irrelevant. Like it's, it's going to seem like a nothing contract in four or five years. People are going to say, oh, it's a bad deal when he's a 25 point player instead of being a 45 point player. But there's a value to what he does in a locker room and to this organization. My last there question, um, just fast forward a week, say the Capitals win out and the Penguins start losing and you do lock up that second wild card spot. Assuming the Rangers take the top, how do you like their chances against them? I think the Caps can take a little bit of a chunk out of the Rangers. Like I think they can give them a series where there's there's one game where either Dylan Strome or Alex Ovechkin goes nuts, and there's one game where Charlie Lindgren steals it. But I can't see the Capitals winning a playoff round against any of these top seeds in the East, and that's nothing against 
this team and, and kind of what they've accomplished through the second half of the season. But I, I think they, they're so out of gas at this point that getting in would be a major accomplishment. Winning around would be insane. What's a, what's a funny story around this team that you, that you like to tell or an interesting story that maybe people don't know about? I remember at one point in the locker room when Anthony Mantha was here, he 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 and, and Beck Ballenstein and somebody else are asking them, talking about how many shark bites there are annually around the world. That was a, co- a topic of conversation they were having. And it seems to be under 40 a year. But that's something Anthony Mantha kind of brought to this this team and a sense of sort of it, it's it's a fun locker room and 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 group that every, every team says they're close. Right. But this is it's always seemed like a, a locker room that was funny and, t- and and tight at the same time. And it, there's been there's been some stories over the years, even a couple of players talking French and being yelled out. We're not talking French in this locker room. This is only we're, this is an only English locker room. Uh, and, and and jokingly, but not quite jokingly, half seriously, just that this is a, a, a team that got along really well. And, and, and for everything that they did down the stretch, if they aren't able to get in, it wasn't for lack of effort. It was because they just didn't have the talent and, and, and kind of ran out of gas down the stretch. And then how, one more for me is how do they navigate the Kuznetsov situation? Because that was going back a year or two years. He's obviously had some issues with, you know, substances and this and that on social media. How did they navigate that? Because I'm sure he's close with a lot of those guys. And that whole situation, now he's playing for a rival in Carolina. How did that kind of pan out? It, it was tough because Brian McClellan tried to trade getting Kuznetsov last offseason with two years left on his contract. And was it was impossible to do. He just knowing the inconsistencies in his game. He was a leading scorer on that 2018 Stanley Cup run, but also has not been able to be anywhere close to point a game for the last couple of years. And at $7.8 million a year, that's what you needed. And so it was tough. The Capitals needed him to produce. He didn't. As soon as he came out, uh, out of the player assistance program, threw him on waivers, Don Waddell and Carolina knew he needed a couple of scorers. Carolina was always that one goal short last year against Florida in that East Final. They go out and get Jake Gensel go out and get Kuznetsov at half the salary. And I think the Capitals were going to buy out Kuznetsov this summer regardless. So getting him now at half that for next year, half the cap hit for next year, finding him greener pastures and, and, and kind of change of scenery, it's a good thing for Carolina. It's a good thing for Washington to get a fresh start and kind of move on from this Kuznetsov era. And speaking of, and I got one more just because, do you think it's time they move on from 2018? Like you said, it seems like a, a million years ago, but because it was, it was six years ago now. And I feel like they, they just didn't ever move on. You know, they make the playoffs the next year, first round exit. Then they'd been missing the playoffs and they're all just saying, well, we won it in 2018. That was a pretty big deal. It's like, who cares now? We have to move on. Do you feel like they're just stuck in the past? Look, I, I grew up outside of Philadelphia, so it's still 1975, and that's <laughs> kind of where I, it came from, too. But no, I don't know that they're stuck in the past. I think maybe the, the signing of Nick Backstrom to a big contract as almost a thank you for what he did more than what he was going to do. There, there are maybe missteps along the way like that. But John Carlson got his contract right after that. T.G. Oshie got his contract the year before that. I don't think, and, and they've, they've jettisoned Lars Eller. Obviously, Nick Backstrom is not going to play again. T.G. Oshie might, may not play again after this season. You're slowly starting to slip away from that to where they're going to have no choice but to, to move away from 2018 because Alex Ovechkin in, in a couple of years is also going to be gone and and banners fly forever. Like there's all, they're, they're always going to have that banner up there. You retire a bunch of these guys' numbers, but they're going to have to move on because at some at some point, Tom Wilson's going to be a, a fourth-line player and John Carlson's going to be a second- or third-line defenseman and they're going to need a fresh crop of players that don't have any connection to that team. And and, and certainly, Barry Trotz was coach that team. Maybe a mistake of, of letting him go and letting Todd Reardon be coach. I think there may be were some missteps in the, the moments after that that led to this. But at, at this point, it, it's going to be time to move on, whether they have whether they like it or not. It's a forced, it's a forced move on. But anyway, Stephen, one anything. more question. I um I know Scott Foster a little bit. I, I work with the Hawks, so he's a big deal. We just did a big kind of expose on him last week or two weeks ago. You just wrote a book, Odd Man in Hockey's Emergency Goalies and the Wildest One Day Job in Sports. Can you talk about that a little bit? It's, it, it, I hope it's a fun read for everybody. It's, it's about the bugs and, and, and not just Scott, uh, Scott Foster and David Ayers and, and, and George Alves who came in for Carolina, but all kind of the near misses over the years of, of how many guys almost went into NHL games and just how freaking absurd it is really that a, a, that a player who's not in the league can play in that league. 
It, it just, you, you know, if Aaron Rodgers and, and Tom Brady got injured, there's no division three quarterback waiting to come into a game. Hmm. Uh, so it's just, it's, it's just the craziest thing in sports to me. And I do have a funny story about, about Scott Foster that, so he and I went back and forth that summer when I was writing the book. And he's like, meet me at this brewery by my house. So we sat down at the bar, put the reporter down. It's like, oh, this will be an hour. Three hours later, had a few beers, told me everything I needed to know about that chapter, about that chapter of his life and that story. And it was just an absolute pleasure to deal with Scott Foster. Yeah, what's cool about <clears throat> all those stories is like these guys get these opportunities and it's it's they, they talk about them forever. It's, it's a huge part of their life. And why wouldn't it be? It's so cool. But yeah, I'm excited to read the book. Go out and check it out. Odd Man in Hockey's Emergency Goalies and the Wildest One Day Job in Sports. It's going to be a great read. Stephen Wino. Thanks for joining us, my friend. This was great. Gentlemen, thanks for having me. All right, everybody. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you on Monday. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Dropping the Gloves with John Scott, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.